So, hi, hi everyone. So, my name is Olis Dubasevich. I am a deputy dean faculty of applied science. Uh, here is my colleague Kostya Lepeshov. He is a research intern in our machine learning lab. She is also he is also uh, a third year student in our like faculty of applied science. Uh, today we will be talking about uh, recognition of Cyrillic text in the wild. So let's briefly talk about like our agenda. So first we will talk about briefly about problems. So what is Cyrillic talk in, uh, recognition of Cyrillic text in the wild? Uh, next we will talk a little bit about like text localization, how to, tell, uh, how, how to solve this problem. Uh, next we will talk about like text recognition, how to recognize that things that we have detected. And next we will talk about data sets, how to approach this problem, like what kind of data sets exist, how it's be possible to solve this problem without data sets, whether like there exists any solution or not uh, without data sets and like how it's be possible to uh, how it will, will be possible to solve this uh, problem for uh, language, for example, like Ukrainian, where is there are not data sets at all. Uh, and like five, uh, five hour next, uh, next on our plan is like our pain and experiments. We'll talk a little bit about our pain while, while we were developing all this stuff, like about uh, some code optimizations that we have done for state-of-the-art solutions. Uh, some uh, bad code examples that were done by senior researchers from Google, uh, some uh, data that we have collected and some experiments that we have done. Also we will have a demo, uh, so it will be in real time, so I believe it will work. Uh, okay, so, uh, many, so a lot of people were asking me about like whether it's the same presentation but with the different guys that, I, uh, that uh, the same presentations that last year but with a different guy. So for those who don't know, like last year in the same time I have uh, the similar presentation of acrylic text uh, recognition but with a different guy. So no, it's not the same presentation at all. Can you try to fix something Okay. What's going on? How could I? Is it better now? I hope so. Uh, so, just, just, just so, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry for that. Now let's talk a little bit what was uh, previous year and like what is the difference. So previous year we have like uh, a recognition of uh, text that was written on uh, like those kangaroo blanks. Uh, so where you have like, uh, as you see here, like childs are putting their like first name, uh, like no, no, the initial name, like, yeah, their surname, their like number of participant and what was the aim of previous year? The aim of the previous year was to recognize those texts. So why it, this task was uh, much more simple? Uh, because uh, you know the structure of your data. So your, your data is located somehow uh, to the grid of this blank. For example, do you know how, for those who was last year, I will just remember. So do you know, so this blank, how is detected, how it's this OCR for this kind of stuff is doing? So they are, you are finding like squares, like marks. For example, here is this one, here is this one. There are also like se several uh, squares on the corners. And after that, you can align your data, your, your like this uh, blank somehow and recognize uh, and you know that, for example, as you see in the previous slide, uh, all letters are written in the, in the squares. So you, your, your text is somehow fixed. And what do you only need to do? You only need to recognize what kind of letter is there. So you can just use some state-of-the-art approaches for uh, multi-class classification. As there is like only 33 letters in Ukrainian alphabet, so you can just use, uh, collect uh, some data and do uh, OCR characterize. In our case, which we have much, what about today? So today we have, we will be talking about much more harder task. So about a task that is called like recognition of text in the wild. Uh, so the idea of that recognition is that you don't know where text exactly located. For example, you have this image and here is like all possible, uh, text is located in all possible places. For example, you have even some intersection of text. For example, like Coca-Cola is intersected with like text uh, drink. Uh, also, uh, this text could be not located only on some dashboards or like, or other things. It could even be located on humans. For example, here you have 
like a number 21 on a guy t-shirt. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about use cases. Why do we need that? Maybe it's like, this is just a simple research problem and no one needs it at all. And like I'm talking here just for fun uh, to, uh, to have a talk in Morning Logica uh, uh, this year. Okay, so first, uh, the most, uh, maybe, the most known uh, solution, uh, like a pro use case for that, is uh, recognition on the flight. In case you were using uh, Google Translate, they have, uh, the Google Translate app, they have a possibility in their app to do translation on the flight. You can just uh, take a photo of text and they will translate you on the flight what is written in their on, the, on this text. For example, here is an example. In case you, for example, in case you are in a city where you don't know their like native language, for example, I don't know German at all. In case I will be in Germany, I can take a photo of some text, uh, translate it to Ukrainian or English. For, I suppose that for English it will work much more better. And after that, I will understand what is written on a uh, on a on a text on this uh, piece of sh paper. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, another case that's quite uh, that are used quite common. So uh, quite often you have some video streams and you don't have subtitles for them. And to correct those subtitles, so there is like several possible ways how could we correct. So we, so you have a video stream for example of some sport event, and there is some guys over like on the, on this video. It could be some like well-known uh, football player or runner. Or some like per or another person like or another sport sportsman or like that, and uh, you want to have a proper spelling of his name in subtitles. One of possible ways how to solve this problem is very often when you have this uh, kind of event, there are some explanation about who is uh, who currently is uh, in the uh, who cu currently is displayed. Uh, on the screen. For example, here is like some uh, runner in, from Rio Olympic Games and you have like his like her surname, name and family name, I suppose. And in case you will use like just uh, speech to text recognition, you can ca have quite a lot of errors in, his, in, her, in her name. And in case you will also like combine two approaches, uh, OCR and like speech to text recognition, you can correct, make this a correction in, uh, in your transcript. Uh, another way how this approach can be used, uh, it's for place recognition. So uh, you want to know whether uh, someone has, uh, w what kind of cars are like passing your autobahn or like what's, uh, whether they paid a text or not, and you can like use this approach, the, sa the same approach for uh, OCR of this license plate, uh, for this license plate. The other approach is very often, so there is like several solutions uh, where is, there are like, it helps blind people to recognize what's going on around them. For example, that there is uh, some uh, building in front of them uh, that there is like where should they go and other things and why one of the approaches that could be used there uh, is uh, OCR to find what kind of building for example over there there is like a, a text like form view and other things uh, so let's talk a little bit about problems that we are solving uh, so here is like some words like Jirelna, Petnav, Dolina, Plus and you want to first localize those words and then uh, recognize them. So on the first step, you are like finding only the bounding boxes for those texts. For example, like here the bounding box will be like close to, like that will, will be Jorana. Here bounding box will be Petna and other things. So uh, there is like, that's no, not the only way how could we, this problem could be solved. Uh, there is also like a way that use character recognition, for example. So you first can like, recognize all characters that are on your image and then use some sophisticated approach to combine those characters that, uh, together. Uh, but this approach is much more harder 
as in this approach you don't uh, you need uh, to write some algorithm to combine those words uh, and it will be much more harder uh, so all state of the art approaches are have like two parts first part is like this text localization part and the other part is like this text recognition part so first let's talk about like text, this text localization part so what need we, what we do need to do we need to detect where our text is located in the image uh, so and and all uh, so how would we solve it? So uh, we will use like neural networks because like neural networks is the best, one of the best approach for everything. Uh, so first, I will not go deep in the theory of neural network, just a few things I, will, I want to mention. So, so first of all, like our neural network is not like uh, some, uh, some neurals at all. So it's just an ordinary function that your parameters of which you are optimizing uh, with back propagation, so this is like so this is not like things like that. Uh, this is just an ordinary function that has like several inputs. For example, x, y. Uh, it could be even more inputs. It depends of what kind of uh, task you are sol solving, and it outputs uh, some value. It, this value could be, for example, uh, x coordinate of your object on uh, on the image. It could be also. Uh, like the center of the box that bounding your image. Okay, so two main parts that I will focus on when I will be talking about neural network. The first one will be architecture. What kind of architecture we have used to solve this problem. So for example, here are like several examples of architecture. The first one is like uh, ResNet 34 with skip connection. The other one is like, it's something similar to the, the first one, but without skip connection. And the last one, was, one is like VGG19. So like this is the first one. As you mentioned here, like oh. this neural network has quite a lot of uh, different layers. So there is like quite a lot of layers, like uh, a convolutional layer. There is also like fully connected that we haven't used at all because they are not uh, good at all. Uh, and there is like also with, within our layers are some like nonlinear function of activation. I will not stop on that. So in case you are a little interested in, in those stuff, I can like answer to your question during the break. Uh, also, the other thing that I will focus on, this is the loss. Uh, it should go down. In case you are a training neural network and your loss do doesn't go down, as something wrong is happening. Uh, so this is like a function that, so when you are like optimizing your function, you should, you uh, like obtaining all the time, you're obtaining some output. And you have like some ground truth that you, with which you need to compare to your ground truth. Uh, how good your neural network is, is represented by loss. There are several like, there are like quite a lot of different losses and we will cover those who are used to uh, for state-of-the-art approaches to text recognition, but here I just want to mention that like two main things that I will be focusing on, will be focusing on. This is like an architecture and uh, uh, and uh, uh, loss. Okay, so let's first like talk a little bit about like object detection. What approaches do we know for object detection, and whether they can somehow be applied? to our text recognition problem. So first of all, like everyone who have uh, worked a little bit with neural networks knows that one of the possible approach uh, to solve this object detection task uh, could be based on uh, multi-class object detection. So there is quite a lot of architecture for that. And uh, like here is like an example of such task. So the idea of the task is that you need to recognize where your objects are located on the image. For example, like here you have a bus and you have like a boundary rectangle for that. You have a person and you have like a boundary rectangle for that. You have a bicycle and you have like a bounding rectangle for that. Okay. So, and like the main question whether we can somehow use uh, this approach uh, to text recognition. Uh, a little spoiler, yes, but with some changes. Uh, so there is like a lot of uh, architecture uh, for uh, this object detection task. Uh, so this, this is like just few of them. Uh, 
but I will give you the key idea how could all of the approaches could be somehow uh, transformed for object detection task. But first, let's talk a little bit about this like object detection tasks, uh, object detection architecture and how they work. So, uh, as an output of your neural network, you have an out, you have a prediction for uh, for each of uh, each cell of the grid. So, what are you doing? You are like you suppose after as an output of your network, you have like a prediction for each cell of this grid as time to bias. As it defined much more with your architect, uh, with architectures that you choose of your neural nets that you have choose. Uh, for each of this cell, you make a prediction. First, uh, so this prediction is combined is uh, has two parts. The first part is uh, x, y, uh, who are that are really at center of the, your image, with high, who uh, that are like width and high of your image and confidence whether there is some object or not. Also, in case we have like a multi-object classification task, we are adding like several values that will be responsible for uh, our class prediction. Uh, uh, also, the things that I want to mend, uh, like to focus on, you are not like, pre pre you are not uh, predicting uh, values from scratch. So, like your width, or your height, from scratch, you are using some anchor boxes, and you are like correcting them. So, for example, like ordinary for the those number of those uh, anchor boxes is also like limited somehow by your architecture. Uh, so, and after you have like a prediction of possible boxes, you have like a confidence what kind of object will be there you do a method called non-maximum suppression. The idea of that method is that in case two, uh, two bounding box has quite large intersection over union, you just uh, put only one of them. And after that you have like a final prediction. Uh, so, question for you. Whether do you think this approach is good enough for text detection? Uh, yes, uh, the charts, uh, the charts, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the one reason, but uh, like still, uh, the state of the art approaches are not on this, that level yet. So there is like much more uh, other reason why uh, these approaches are not not work well for uh, for tax recognition. Any other ideas? Uh, this approach can uh, catch the whole phrase, not the uh, central uh, word. Uh, so, like, uh, for as I uh, as I so showed you on the first slide, so we are just uh, so so we are just doing this recognition word by, so and all state of the art approach are doing this recognition word by. Then, in case you want to recognize like a full statement or some phrase, you are just combining all those phrases together. And the reason, like, I will give you a hint. So the idea, the reason why. This approach is not a good enough for our tax detection because those uh, size of those rectangle, uh, rectangles that are bounding your texts, uh, they are not good enough. The reason for that because your text, when you are taking photo of your text, you are not taking it parallel to the text where it's located. So you have like some perspective. Uh, uh, perspective correction, you need to do some perspective correction of that task. Uh, that's why for text recognition are used the same architecture but with a little bit different idea. So I will show you this idea based on one of the state of the art approaches that was posted in 2017. Uh, this is it's called like a law uh, v2 for text detection and it was um, mentioned in this Neumann papers that were published on ICCV uh, in 2017. Uh, so, first of all, let's talk a little bit. So, as I mentioned, this architecture will be based on YOLO. Uh, so, let's talk a little bit first, what is YOLO? So, YOLO, as I said, you, this is like a multi-class archi architecture for multi-class classification. So, what are you doing? You are classifying a bounding box or you are finding a bounding box 
for all possible labels that you have in the, your data sets. For example, whether it's like for a person, for a car, there should also be some rectangle. Uh, for a bicycle, there will be some rectangle and other thing. Uh, okay, so how it's done? So uh, for each grid cell, as I said to you before, you are doing like several predictions. And this is prediction, how all this prediction are have like X center, center of your bounding box, uh, X and Y coordinate of center of your bounding box, width and height of your bounding box, and score, whether there are any objects or not. Also, it have uh, like uh, prediction for 20 classes. Uh, in our case, we don't need this prediction for 20 classes or, uh, as we only need to know whether there is text or not at all. So we don't need to classify whether there is a person or bicycle or at all. We just need to classify the, is there a text or not. So here is an architecture of your law. Uh, we will be talking about, so uh, this is like a basic law architecture. The architecture that this approach is based on is based on your law version 2. As you see here, there is like one more one issue that was fixed in your law version 2. It's called like fully connected layer. Uh, and what they done in Yellow version 2, they just uh, took uh, all architectures that was before this layer and removed this part of architecture. Quite simple, because like fully connected uh, layer was an issue. Uh, to make it more deep, they also added several more layers, several more convolutional layers. And in output, they uh, have this grid 7x7 seven that gives you a prediction for each grid cell and a vector of 125 values. What, uh, what they, this 125 values will stand for, I will explain on the next slide. But one thing that I want to mention is that before this, uh, some, uh, the information that comes to these convolutional layers can be called an embeddings of those predictions. Why it could be, can be called an embeddings of those predictions? Because that's something that, uh, based on which you are predicting what, what, what kind of class is there. And uh, so we can, as here we'll, we'll go some embeddings, here we will go some embeddings, we can like add more features for that, uh, training more features on that embeddings. What was originally done in this paper? So, as I said to you, for each cell you have like, uh, for each this grid cell you have 125 values uh, per this grid cell. Uh, this 125 values are, do, are prediction for five anchor boxes that are you correcting in the future. And uh, five anchor boxes, in case we will divide 125 by five, we will obtain like 25 values. What those 25 values stand for? So first five values stand for uh, like our will will be something that will be put based on what we will make a prediction of our center of our uh, of our bounding box, width of our bounding box, height of our bounding box, and confidence of our bounding box, whether there is object or not. And there is also like some values based on which we will make a prediction. Uh, what kind of class is it object in? So whether it's like a, a play, whether is, is it, it is a person, or it is a, some other thing like bicycle, or, or I don't know. Uh, so what going on after uh, uh, you put your how out, this output from your network? You make some transformation. This transformation is done for the reason uh, that. Uh, you want somehow to limit your neural, your prediction. First of all, what, what, any assumption what this could be? What this kind of function could be? Sigmoida. Yeah, this is like sigmoida. Uh, and so the reason why you are making this sigmoida transformation for that is because uh, you have a different, you can have like a different size of uh, output or, uh, of an input of your image. So for example, it could be 124 pixels by 124. And your system, you expect that you, your system will work for any size of picture you will 
input uh, have as an input and, or, or uh, have as an input. That's why prediction ordinary done not in scale of uh, from zero pixel to 124 by but from scale from zero to one to one. That means that uh, uh, your you will just need to multiply your prediction by on 124. That's why we are using this uh, sigmoid to somehow fix this prediction from value uh, between the value 0 and 1. Also, you are doing some, so as I said to you before, those widths and height are not predicting from scratch. You are predicting them based on some anchor boxes. And what you are doing here, you are just correcting these bounding boxes. So you have like a bounding box, uh, an anchor box like that has widths pw and uh, height ph and you are correcting them with uh, exponent. Are any assumption why exponent is used here and not like just a simple multiplication? So my assumption is to make this, uh, so like my assumption, so I, I haven't found any explanation of that, but from mathematical point of view, my assumption is that is done for the reason to not correct this, uh, like this anchor box to a lot. So in case you have like a base anchor box has uh, has uh, sides two to two, one and two, your final box will not uh, go uh, a lot from this anchor box. That's why uh, this exponent is used to make it as close to anchor box as possible. And ordinary those anchor box are, how, um, are somehow uh, computed based on the data set you have in case you are like solving for some specific case as we will have. For example, in our case, uh, a little spoiler, we will have like 14 anchor boxes and they are computed based on distributions that we have in our entire data set. Okay, and what kind of loss is yours there? So to train our neural network, we, they are just, just using the simple mean squared error loss. This is just a simple difference of variables that is predicted and variables that you want to your target variable. Put it to the square. Okay, so to solve this perspective issue, what kind of appro the, the approach that was proposed in, uh, uh, in this state of the art paper uh, from 2017, they proposed uh, that they will uh, introduce a definition of a rotated bounding box. This rotated bounding box has, has its center with x and y coordinates, with height, and they also added one more parameter. As you remember, I mentioned you that there is like embeddings and you can like add more parameters in your, in your final prediction. So what do they do there? here? They just add like parameters that respond for your angle of so, so, so how your bounding box is rotated. So what their final architecture was, so this was like the simple YOLO V2 with, uh, that has like 168 prediction uh, in the output. Uh, so for their, to solve this problem, they use like 14 different bounding anchor boxes. The reason why they used these 14 anchor boxes was because they computed this from, uh, from a distribution of uh, bounding boxes on entire data set. So they used some like entire data set, computed how, uh, what size of bounding boxes could be there, and then used this information to train their neural network. Uh, so as they just adopted and didn't propose their like, own architecture, uh, for each 14 anchor boxes, they held 12 predictions. But six of them, they didn't use at all. They decided, okay, let's not train this part of neural network. It's a little bit strange solution because still those uh, several layers somehow fill your memory and you cannot like increase a batch size of for, for your, uh, for your solution for your task. That's why it's a little bit strange why not to use the part of neural network because it was like quite simple to change. But for some reason they decided not to use them at all. Uh, so and all the others, so our respond to 
something that will in future be a center of your bounding box, like the x, the y, something that in future will be width, height of, width and height of your uh, bounding box, something that in future will be an angle of your bounding box, and something that will be in future like a confidence from whether there will be object or not at all. Uh, so after that, there are like some transformation is done. So the first like two transformation are, are quite similar to those who, that were in uh, YOLO architecture. Uh, the, other, the last one is just simple assigning those value to the theta. So that's the something that, and for training this neural network, they use the same loss, like mean squared, year, mean squared error loss. Okay, another approach that also is a state of the art so there is like a two state of the art, it depends of, on what kind of data sets they are testing. Uh, it's called like, it's based on architecture that is called FPN. Like the general idea that come before FPN, uh, over FPN, is that in case you use like just uh, your quite deep architecture uh, with large filters, you will lose a lot of information when you will go deep. When you will go deep. So in each step, you are losing some information. And in those last layers, there will be not information at all uh, from the first like, image. What FPN proposed, they proposed to use, like what uh, for was this FPN architecture proposed? They used to somehow to share this information between, uh, between parts of architecture. So it's quite similar, in case you are familiar with UNET, it's quite similar to UNET, but they use uh, but also, uh, but the, the difference between UNET is they use, uh, for example, here as could be used some upsampling and not uh, uh, and not just simple like conf transpose. Uh, so there is like a, a little bit some difference between those two types of architecture. Uh, so one of the state of the art, at least in speed uh, approaches, is called EAST. So. East mean like efficient and accurate. So it's quite efficient, it could be run in real time, and it's quite accurate. It's much more better than in, on many data sets than the other approach. So as I mentioned you, so there is like this FPN architecture, FPN type of architecture is used. Uh, so where you like first reducing your uh, initial image with uh, different levels of filters and then you are uh, doing like increasing your information and sharing like information between parts of your network you are increasing with upsampling and sharing with uh, like so some skip, skip connection and uh, as an output they have like a two parts the first part is a score map, so whether it's, uh, there is a text or not, and the other part is a response for geometry. They tested two approaches to uh, find the geometry of this text. The first approach is based on airbox. So what is, so as I told you before, for text recognition it's better to use those rotated bounding box. But they somehow redefined those rotated bounding box. In the previous version, as in this 2017 paper, uh, they have, for definition of the rotation of this rotated bounding box, they use the center of the bounding box uh, with high and angle. The, here they somehow, uh, they change a little bit. So first of all, they, so as you see, here is the rotated bounding box. Then you have a point, so they also have a center of this bounding box. But what they changed, they are not defining like width and high, but they defining like four, var four variables. They are defining like distance to uh, the size of this rotated bounding box. So here you may see them like they with a red line, with yellow line, with blue line, and with purple line. Uh, and also, as in previous versions, they use this angle to uh, to. May, to tell how skewed this bounding box is. The other approach they, they used is just a prediction of four corners of the bounding box. Just simple 
quadrangle. So there is like a two possible geometries. They, they tested a two possible geometries. The first one is rotated bounding box. The other one is uh, this quadrangle where you need to, to test, uh, test uh, to when you need to detect all four corners. Uh, okay, so the final loss, as I mentioned to you before, they have this like a score map prediction and geometry predi prediction. That's why the final loss includes two parts, like a score map, map loss and geometry map loss. And so here you have like a score map loss and geometry map loss. And what's this lambda stand for? Something that I really don't love in, uh, in uh, computer vision papers, that's quite often they somehow first define this lambda and they say, okay, let's in, our, in all our experiments, lambda is equal to one. And it's like a, appears quite often. For example, like here you see two state-of-the-art papers for text detection and in both of them they first define this lambda and then somewhere in the end tell, eh, okay, in all our experiments our lambda is equal to one. And here you may say even like three lambdas. And after like a two paragraph of text, they decided to mention that, uh, in all our experiments, all lambda are set to one. That's like really something that I hate a lot. So for this core map loss, they used a little bit modified cross entropy loss. So uh, I will not stop on why it's, uh, on what, how it's modified. The key idea is that they use some parameter beta that somehow, uh, that somehow helps you to solve this imbalance of negative and positive uh, results. Uh, for to understand like this uh, concept losses of that they decided to use for, uh, for this uh, geometry stuff, let's talk a little bit about like different losses. So there is like a simple L1 loss that are just an absolute value between two variables. So it's like a, a target variable minus variables that you want, that you predicted. Uh, so this is like simple model. That's, uh, here is also like another uh, quite common use loss that's called L2. It's just a simple parable. Quite often, uh, for the reason that L2 is not good enough in all cases, for example, as you know, your neural network is learned based on derivative of your uh, loss. And in case of L2, that it's like it's as it's just a single as it just a line if y equal x, the derivative will be one. That's why this loss is not good enough for learning, and quite often it's com uh, and with L2 there is that issue that for large value it doesn't go fast quite fast quite enough. So somehow those two loss are combined. So smooth L1 is a part of uh, is a part of L2 and uh, somehow shifted part of L1. So uh, for the geometry prediction of rotated bounding box, they use uh, they use also a two different losses. So the first loss is based on our intersection over union. As intersection over union somehow can be uh, in, somehow can be interpreted as uh, as a probability of whether our bounding box has fitted well or not. In the other laws, so as I said to you, the prediction in the other laws is are are those four corners. So that's why x and y coordinates of four corners. And the final prediction, the final, uh, the final loss, is use this smooth L1 divided by the largest distance between those points, multiplied by eight. The reason why eight, because uh, there will be like eight difference here. And like they multiply this. That's, this is an approach that's quite, quite, quite often used like for some key points detection. So, as I mentioned, use smooth. L1 is something between 
L1 and L2. So here is all the math that uh, comes with this paper. I don't want to put it on one slide uh, to disturb you, but like to summarize this stuff, I want to put it like to look. So let's like try to run one more, more time again. So like the final loss is a combination of score map loss and this geometry loss. And this geometry loss like have a two possibility. In case you choose your prediction to be a rotated bounding box, you, you choose one loss. And in case you, will, you choose your prediction will be a quadrangle, you choose another loss. Okay, so that's all for my first part. Maybe you have some questions and like uh, I can answer to them. Yeah. So that coefficient lambda uh, was chosen like that just to make those two parts of loss to be in the same range of values or what is the heuristic? Uh, so like my assumption how in case you have like a some quite hard loss, for example, in this case where you have like uh, several losses, uh, how those lambda are choosed. So we have, together with Costa, we have experimented with several different approaches how to choose those lambda. And the general idea behind that is that first uh, you need to learn, you somehow prioritize what need to be learned first. For example, first you need to, you want to learn at least whether they are object or not. Then you want to make learn geometry. Then you want to make uh, to learn some other feature. And in case those features are independent, you can first like uh, try to train like one feature, and then like look how uh, each so like like create put those lambda in such a way that on each so first will be trained one part, then will be trained another part, then will be trained another part. In case. No, 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 I'm not manually adding components to loss. I'm trying to um, find, so for example, with, with this tax detection problem. So for example, we can use here, like we have like a loss for uh, a language and a loss for, uh, attack, for OCR. So it's quite clear Then, in case you will learn first loss for a text, then will you learn for a text for, a, for a lambda. And you saw, you know that in the initial step, your loss is quite slower, one is quite slower. So you try first to learn this large loss, and then this large task, and then this small task. Maybe in the break I will explain you in details. Yeah. Yeah. Here? With, with what? Okay. <laughs> okay, it was duration. Uh, yeah, there was like another slide where it was clearly the word on the letter O. Yeah, so there is like a, yeah. Do you find it too hard to classify? Uh, no, no, it depends on uh, the type of architecture you use. For example, this is, is trained and, and what, it depends on what kind of data do you have. In case you are like want to find large text and small text, uh, this architecture like first your log v two is not good enough because it scale your even if you have like for example a photo taken from my phone it's like four K yeah, and what does it do? And you in case you will try you zoom it on you know, your iPhone it will be you will see all the text that is over there. But this yellow version 2 has an input, uh, uh, an image 150 by oh, 512 by 512. Then after reducing uh, this large image to the small image, uh, this, Im this small text will be not seen at all. So it depends on what type of architecture you will choose and whether your, uh, your, your network was trained on the large images at the beginning or not. And for example, East could do that. So we will show you some examples and it will be, and uh, for example, our final model is com use this East and it's worked quite well even with such small, exa small examples. Okay. Uh, is East used only for text? Uh, so, no, so like East could be used uh, for any kind of task. 
uh, this, ki this kind of architecture could be used only uh, for any kind of task, but those guys to become uh, more famous, they decided to use, so how it works. So someone proposed a new method for object detection. Then you are like uh, a guy who are working in a field of text detection. You find this idea and like say, oh, this idea should overperform in case it overperform all uh, others of for multi-class object detection, it will overperform uh, everyone in text detection. So like, let's me quick write a paper published in ICCV and become a famous guy because uh, I, I just use the same architecture that was for multi-label classification and works. It quite good, sh so f as it was for example with YOLO, they, uh, there was like a YOLO paper was published on uh, CVPR I suppose and the guys uh, just understand that the same approach could be used for uh, a text recognition and they decided oh, okay let's publish a new paper with, uh, with a little bit changes for text recognition and say that we are a state-of-the-art approach for text localization. Yeah. You mentioned that there are sometimes uh, these obstacles with the size of the image, that you have to resize it for it to become an input of the neural yeah. network. Uh, are there any approaches that, you, that are like fully convolutional or just not dependent on the size of the input? So this is like, the both like Yolo V2 and, um, uh, and East are like, doesn't depend on the size of initial image. They, the reason why they shift, so like, 522 was just the largest uh, image that they could train on their like power sources. Oh. So they just not have like in case you want for a larger image, you need to have like several GPUs. You need to uh, somehow have a batch size uh, at least that what batch size one will fit. Yeah. objects but uh, how about the real cases when you need to uh, split the sentence to separate words and uh, when the distance between words is not uh, big enough or uh, distance between uh, letters is bigger than expected and so on and uh, especially interesting thing is that sometimes uh, some not uh, textual objects can be uh, detected like a text, like uh, when some people place the uh, hand like seven, yes, it could be detected as a seven. Uh, uh, so like, uh, I, I will talk a little bit about, so Kostya will talk a little bit about those things in, in the next part of uh, his of our lecture and it's those, your, your questions are much more related to uh, when you are like already localize your text, how do you recognize uh, what is like what is written on this part of the text. Yes, very often, um, a little spoiler, as all this data, uh, all these this approaches are somehow, there is like not a lot of data for OCR at all. I don't know the reason for that. Maybe the reason for that is because like large corporations like Google don't want to share data for OCR. Uh, maybe there is a little quite hard to mark up this data because even when I try to mark up, I spend, even in my best uh, form, I spend uh, like 10 minutes for marking up one image. And so it's like quite time consuming. And, uh, but there is not quite a lot. So how, how these approaches are, how, how this task of problems are solved, uh, there is used somehow a synthetic data for that. And you're like, so it's depend of how kind, what type of synthetic data will you generate. In case your synthetic data will be uh, good, uh, have all these cases, your final neural network will can recognize all these cases. In case your synthetic data have just simple uh, words with one font, it will not work for sure on other fo fonts and other things. Right, but like Costa will explain you more in more details how to find those, uh, uh, those white spaces between letters, white spaces between uh, text, uh, between parts of the word and other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some more question about the scaling. Uh, I didn't get about the sigmoid function. Uh, how, uh, 
if they have uh, the initial, for, for example, 4K image yeah. resolution, and uh, the first layer is 512 by 512, how is it? Is it about the shrinkage of the initial image? Or yeah, so you are like shrink, shrinking the initial image. The final prediction is done uh, from 0 to 1. And like you can interpolate those zero to one into your like initial image. It doesn't like as it's relative uh, this size and not like an absolute size. You can just it's uh, used for like one hundred twenty four. But like really, for example, this east it's trained on uh, even on high high quality of image. The reason why this ICCV paper wasn't trained on. Uh, like large images because they how, were somehow limited to their resources. So there was no, I suppose that there were training on some 1080, uh, NVIDIA 1080 and they just, just cannot fit a larger image on that. And your law is somehow sense on the stage of uh, training, it's somehow sensitive to the number of batch you choose, number of images that you choose in one batch. You need to. It could not be like too, 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 too not too a lot, like to not, not not too. So there is no, it could not be like there should be like from ten to twenty, at least. I can. Yeah. I have a question. You said that we have to make some perspective transformation or of some kind because sometimes we don't have like image just uh, front, which you, you have a um, clear rectangle, so to say, but you mentioned that you only rotate the rectangle and you don't project it. Yeah. So after, so first we find this uh, rotated rectangle and then we transformed it to uh, ordinary rectangle. Okay, but w what if uh, you have, like here, you have really a skewed perspective, like letter Z is far, further than letter A, for example. And if it was even a uh, bigger angle, you'll, you'll have not rectangle, but something, something different. And like it's solved by uh, a good synthetic data generation. Okay. So this approaches for synthetic data generation, they tried somehow to catch all these cases. So there is like quite a lot of heuristics that are like doing like, okay, let's replace this letter, let's make this one letter smaller, let's make, uh, like, let's find a curve based on what uh, our text will be located, uh, let's, uh, uh, so Kostya will be talking more about that. I don't want to have like quite a lot of spoilers for second part. 